Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 30th, 2017, and my guests are Brink Lindsay of the Niskanen Center, where he directs the Open Society Project, and Stephen Tallis of Johns Hopkins and the Niskanen Center. Steve appeared on Econ Talk in April of 2014, discussing kludgeocracy, his term for overly complex political governance. Today, Brink and Steve will be discussing their book, The Captured Economy, How the Powerful Enrich Themselves, Slow Down Growth, and Increase Inequality. Brink, welcome to Econ Talk, and Steve, welcome back. Russ, thanks for having us. Thank you for having us, Russ. Now, in the beginning of the book, you write, here's a quote, the rise of inequality is to a significant extent a function of state action rather than the invisible hand. And this state action, by suppressing and misdirecting entrepreneurship and competition, has rendered our economy less innovative and dynamic as well as less fair. I want you to expand on this central idea of the book and give us a short sketch of the of the argument. Brink, why don't you start us off? Uh, here in the 21st century, the U.S. economy is uh, suffering a kind of double whammy melees. Uh, inequality, rising inequality, uh, particularly uh, with uh, <clears throat> increasing shares of total income going to a, a favored few at the very top, and also slow growth. Uh, the average growth rate uh, so far in the 20th century has been about 1% in terms of uh, growth, annual growth and real GDP per capita. That's half the growth rate uh, of the that. Uh, was the average rate uh, during the 20th century. So we've had a a precipitous growth slowdown at the same time that the benefits for growth are increasingly skewing to favor only a a relative few. Uh, Put these two things together uh, and uh, you have uh, dimming economic prospects uh, for uh, large numbers of Americans uh, and uh, gathering uh, pessimism, frustration, resentment, uh, and despair uh, over uh, uh, <clears throat> economic prospects and over political institutions that are delivering poor economic prospects. Uh, these phenomena, slow growth and high inequality, are extremely complex. There are many causes. We do not present a monocausal silver bullet analysis, uh, but we do say that there is an underreported, underappreciated aspect of these problems, and that is government policies that are actively making matters worth on both fronts. So we identify government policies that are simultaneously bad for economic growth by uh, stymieing competition uh, and distorting market forces, and do so in a way that redistributes income and wealth up the socioeconomic scale. Steve, you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the core of the argument we have, and I think um, there's a point both on the left and, and the right um, that we we address. Um, part of it is on the right, um, there's uh, often a discussion of rent-seeking and government distortion at the same time time as people on the uh, the right generally see uh, their role as defending the moral status of the distribution of income and our argument is that if that's um, if the first part of that is true right the government has a large distorting role through regulation and other kind of uh, market um, uh, constraints that must have an effect on the distribution of income and our argument is that there's very substantial evidence that we um, we put in in the case studies that uh, those distortions of markets have generally been uh, very strongly skewed over the last 30 to 40 years upward. Um, That's affecting the distribution of income as well as slowing down innovation. And uh, therefore, the distribution of income is something that people on the right should feel that they can um, address as an uh, independent issue of, um, of inequality without thinking that that somehow um, uh, I, uh, violate some underlying set of uh, normative principles that they hold. And before we go go on, I think it'd be useful to listeners to for each of you to give a a thirty second or ten second thumbnail sketch of your own ideology to the extent you have one. You can say I'm ideology free. Most of us aren't, of course, but uh, I, I think one of the things that makes your your book interesting and and your work interesting is that you you don't see the world exactly the same way. So. Uh, Brink, why don't you um, start? 
Yeah, I come from the libertarian uh, world, uh, and uh, I'm uh, a, a kind of quirky, soft libertarian. Uh, sometimes call myself a libertarian, uh, but uh, even though I'm at the Niskanen Center now, I wrote this book uh, as a vice president at the Cato Institute, uh, which is uh, the premier libertarian think tank in D.C. And Steve? Yeah, and I consider myself um, like uh, like Brink says he's a so, uh, sort of soft libertarian, and I consider myself, I guess, a soft um, liberal. Um, I have always had a, a more redistributive uh, view of, um, of fairness, but I've also always been um, skeptical of the uh, the ability of government to always vindicate uh, our normative principles, and that tension which you addressed in our conversation about kleptocracy, that tension between um, a normative belief in um, a fair distribution of income and a uh, political or institutional belief that government's not always very good at doing that is the basic tension in my liberalism. And that's I mean, what pulls both of Brink and I toward something like what we call libertarianism. And just to lay my cards on the table, listeners are probably pretty familiar with where I stand on these issues that we're going to be talking about. But I, I want to. I like how you framed it. I want to just add a, a couple things. Uh, as listeners will know, I'm I'm quite skeptical of some of the empirical claims about the growth of inequality. I think they've been distorted, not just the growth of inequality, but say the, the growth of of well being of the middle class. And I think those claims have been distorted by um, various changes in the in in America that are not related to the economy, changes in family structure, as well as the challenge of measuring. Uh, price changes accurately, which means that after we correct for inflation, we often, I think, misunderstand what's happened to standard of living over time for the middle class, say. Um, at the same time, I don't want to defend – you used a very interesting phrase, Steve, the the moral – I think you called it something like the moral dimensions of the of the existing distribution of income. I, I'm, I, I'm agnostic on that, um, more or less. I, I, I understand that many people are born with great advantages that they're not entitled to and and suffer through handicaps that that weren't their fault. And so those have huge effects on how the distribution of income uh, that we see in in the real world comes out. And I don't have any – I don't want to make any moral claims for that. My tendency is to focus on the fact that you also alluded to, Steve, which is that I don't think the government does a very effective job in, in changing that. And I'm not sure its desire, uh, its efforts to change that are motivated by what some people think. So um, that, that's my ap- approach to these issues. Uh, before we do that, I, before we go farther, further, I'd like to hear uh, one of you, and I'll, we can we'll start with Steve, and you can hand it over to Brink if you prefer. But Steve, give us the standard argument from people who argue we don't, we shouldn't do anything. That what, what's their explanation? For the causes of the growing inequality, what, what's the standard sort of market-based argument for why we're seeing growing inequality as opposed to, say, because of government intervention? Yeah, and so, again, just to reiterate the point Brink had, that, that ours is not a monocausal explanation. We're not arguing that everything or even the majority of inequ- growing inequality is a function of um, the kind of state action we're talking about. But um, the standard argument, again, which we think has some value – is part of it is globalization, right? Um, as markets uh, increase in scale, the um, the gains that can be had by the um, by the biggest winners increase proportionately. Um, and I think there's something to that, right? We have had a globalization of the economy. We do have people who can sell their skills and firms that can sell their products over a global scale, and that's obviously going to influence inequality. The second thing, which Brink dealt with in his book, uh, Human Capitalism, is that the returns on skill, um, uh, both domestically and internationally, have gone up. Uh, That's a function of changes in the technological structure of the economy. And and that is driving inequality. Um, so both of those, those are, you know, I think the standard mainstream economic profession tends to emphasize uh, those two elements. And we think they're both important and relevant. Um, some of those actually have more uh, state distortion in them than you'd think, right? Certainly the human capital um, uh, production process is deeply embedded with uh, with state action. 
Um, but in general, those are that, that's what you th- I might think of as the standard story against which we're saying that's incomplete if you don't take into account the ways that um, market structures have actually been actively distorted by various different forms of, um, of capture by uh, the wealthy and the already advantaged. Frank, uh, what would the left say? What's, what's you know, the left's argument? Would would invoke a phrase that you used at the beginning of your introduction, which um, which I strongly disagree with. Uh, in in general, I certainly recognize it in certain circumstances, which is that that many gains, much of the gains from growth, have accrued to the quote favored few. And you know, to take to take the opposite side of that view, Sergey Brin uh, and Larry Page, graduate students who eventually have Develop Google. They weren't the favored few who put a ring, some kind of fence around their wealth, and made sure that they gained more of everything. They vaulted from the bottom of the income distribution to the top, and that was through a variety of things that government was involved with, of course. But it wasn't like they uh, there was some conspiracy that they manipulated uh, the government to give them advantages that allowed them to to get very wealthy. But you can react to that if you want, but make the general point. I agree the, wholeheartedly. Okay. That's my reaction. No, react, but give this the, the general argument that the left makes uh, about the causes of increasing inequality. Yeah, so so Steve talked about a, a kind of blind spot on the right where uh, they – where people on the right simultaneously believe that the economy is, uh, is being deranged by excessive uh, government intervention and at the same time that the distribution of wealth uh, is – uh, is fine, uh, and that the people at the top are all, all makers uh, and deserve their money and should have low taxes because uh, they earned uh, they their, their <laughs> income. Um, meanwhile, there's a kind of a corresponding uh, blind spot, and those two uh, beliefs don't really fit very well together. Uh, there's a corresponding blind spot on the left, uh, which is to believe uh, that um, uh, that. Uh, <clears throat> inequality is the natural result of market forces. That's a that's a very sort of ideologically convenient belief for the left because uh, it then uh, calls uh, highlights the need for strong active government uh, to uh, counteract and uh, restrain uh, the market. So, uh, uh, but uh, <clears throat> you know, progressives are quite alert to the to this power of the rich to uh, influence and game the political process. So, but that then is in tension with their belief uh, that this is all natural market forces or capitalism run amok. Uh, it's a kind of a strangely restrained view of plutocratic political power they have, which is the plutocrats uh, dominate the political process and write the rules to make them purely neutral so that market forces rip. And when those market forces rip, the rich come out on top. Uh, of course, uh, if you have that kind of power, you're not just going to write neutral rules. You're going to write rules that favor yourself and rig the market in your favor. So here again, there's a kind of uh, implicit tension in two beliefs that uh, the left holds. Uh, we resolve uh, both tensions on the left and the right by pointing out that there is a, uh, a, a largish area of, of public policy uh, where government is uh, slowing down growth and exacerbating inequality simultaneously. So I, I think that's a little unfair to the left. I'm going to give the left's uh, position, if I might, uh, which overlaps with a lot of the themes in the book. Um, so in some sense, it's, it, there's, a, there's a strong left-leaning interventionist theme in the book, of mainly removing interventions that that, that, have, that have favored the rich. But I think the left make a, a stronger critique that I, I, don't, I didn't see you deal with. So I'm going to start with that. The left argues that there's too much political power. There's too much power in in the among the wealthy. They have two kinds of power. They have economic power because they have these large economic organizations that allegedly exploit customers or take advantage of of some kind of um, pricing monopoly, ability to to raise price and keep keep uh, revenues flowing. And profits flowing. So there's there's economic power. Large corporations wield economic power, they would argue, and particularly on Wall Street. And then they would also argue that it's – the part that you mentioned, that they also wield political power. Uh, so they, I don't think they see them as um, 
No, and, no, that's quite right. They, they, of course, the 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 left is quite uh, clear that the rich wields political power, but they they tend to see what the how the left uses that power in very incomplete terms. That is, they see the you mean the rich. The, the, Excuse me. That the rich, the rich use their power to keep taxes and regulations low, basically to get government out of the way so that they can accumulate wealth. What they miss is that uh, if you've got all that power, uh, you don't just use it to uh, push government out of the way. You use it to recruit government to be an active agent uh, of of your own enrichment. Well said. Uh, so that that's the part they miss. Steve, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, and I think another way to think about this is that. The um, the argument, you know, going in a way all the way back to Marx is that um, capitalism has an inherently concentrating effect. Um, the more that you get rid of uh, informal uh, or formal constraints on markets, the broader the scope for um, for inequality. And therefore, if you want to reduce inequality, the only way you can do that is to somehow throw sand in the gears of the machine. Right. Um, and uh, so regulation is generally positive in this view because it reduces the scope for markets to turn everything solid into air and produce the potential for uh, worldwide um, uh, inequality, not just within the nation state. And I think our argument is that markets actually have some countervailing effects, right? Uh, where there are super normal profits of various sorts, where you've got the potential for market entry, that creates the opportunity to at least compete away some of those uh, super normal profits. Um, as a result um, of that, uh, people who have advantages are going to try to lock them in through state action. They're not just going to try to uh, create an entirely free market in which um, they're able to scoop up all the gains. They're going to try and keep out those um, who would challenge their various forms of super normal profits. And I think that's the area where, in general, we think the left has a, um, has a blind spot. They don't actually see at least some of those countervailing forces that markets properly organized have in the way that um, uh, that advantage interests um, actively try to game markets, um, not just to keep regulation out, but to use regulation as a uh, as a weapon uh, against their competitors and against outsiders. If you look at the scholar most associated with the inequality issue on the left, Thomas Piketty, uh, here he presents this uh, this view of capitalism's natural tendency towards concentration and inequality very starkly. For him, it's just in the DNA of capitalism uh, that because R is greater than G, uh, there is this innate tendency and only wars and revolutions can temporarily uh, 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 interrupt that tendency. Uh, so in, in Piketty's vision, there's just no politics or institutions at all. There are these deep primal economic forces that are pushing us towards inequality, and we believe that misses a whole bunch of the picture. And R greater than G is the return on investment relative to the growth rate of the overall economy. And of course, we, we I interviewed Piketty, um, and we'll put a link up to that episode for, for listeners who want to uh, hear that and, and find out more about those ideas. The part I thought you were missing – that was a nice summary by both of you. But the part I thought you were missing is the, the, the left then goes, goes further and says, and therefore, we need to get the rich out of the political system. They have an unfair advantage because of the donation process, and we need campaign finance reform. And I, I don't think you talk about that. My response to that is always, well, if government had less power, it wouldn't be worth buying. Uh, and then we don't we need campaign finance reform. And that campaign finance reform is very difficult to enforce, and will encourage other types of influence by the rich that will be less transparent. That's my argument. I don't know if it's a good argument or bad argument, but I'd like to hear your reaction to that, Brink. Um, well, uh, we do uh, uh, address the campaign finance issue in passing uh, by saying that uh, that we think that is a, a, a kind of distraction uh, from. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the most uh, effective and constructive approaches towards uh, towards limiting special interest influence. So uh, both the left and the right worry about special interests dominating uh, uh, um, policy making. Uh, they have different ideas of who those special interests are. Uh, the left in particular worries about the, the rich uh, dominating the process and they worry about uh, campaign finance uh, and uh, as, as the main vehicle for influence. Uh, so there's a great deal of of, of 
focus on kind of stopping stopping the lobbying, stopping the money, controlling uh, the the interests that are trying to influence the government, uh, we think that a much more constructive approach uh, is to fortify the government and make it less vulnerable to and less dependent upon uh, um, the special interests that are lobbying it. And in particular, the main source of dependence that uh, – uh, that the government has on interest groups is policy relevant information, the data they need to draft laws. Um, maybe Steve can follow up on this a bit more, uh, but because at the precise time that the uh, scope of government has expanded and the complexity of government regulation uh, has soared, uh, <clears throat> The analytical capacities within both the legislative and executive branches uh, have uh, not only not been keeping pace, but have actually been uh, been shrinking. Uh, so that uh, when the government is making policy, it is de deeply dependent upon uh, the interested parties that uh, that are being regulated uh, for the information they need to govern. Using that informational advantage uh, is a huge uh, uh, tool that special interests can get to to make rules come out in their favor. So, Steve, I want you to add to that, but I think the, just to emphasize the point, the, yeah. the book's called The Captured Economy, and, and the idea that regulators are captured by uh, the industries they're supposed to regulate, uh, you know, goes back to, well, probably goes back to Adam Smith, but, you know, it's associated today with, for me, with George Stigler. It's also associated with Joseph Stiglitz on the, on the other side of the ideological spectrum among economists. And that, um, this idea that it's it's not just a revolving door problem, but a problem of information control is very interesting. So why don't you expand on that? Yeah, so I should say, first of all, that uh, uh, at least my view is that the standard regulatory capture argument is overdrawn um, in that uh, regulatory capture is a thing, right? It's actually something that, that happens, but it's not a universal or iron law of government. Government agencies and government functions actually vary systematically in terms of their how susceptible they are to uh, being captured by, uh, by affected interests. So that's one thing to say on, on that. Um, on information, I think one of the arguments we have is that typically when people think about lobbyists, they overemphasize their sort of coercive power, right? The fact they can use money to bend um, actors to their, uh, to their will. And I think the evidence of that is, um, is a little thin in, in political science. Um, and therefore, there's an overemphasis on campaign finance. Um, on the other hand, however, there is a under emphasis on the ability of organized interests to influence the informational environment that policymakers face when they actually make decisions. And that's on two levels, right? Brink emphasized the level where policymakers are, uh, something's on the agenda, and then they're trying to decide what to do. And then um, they, the scope of what they do is influenced by the information that they're able to get from uh, either outsiders or insiders. And that's important. But there's another which um, sociologists are referred to as the second face of power, which is the um, whether or not a particular area is even considered, a particular idea is even considered to be what Jack Balkan has called uh, on the wall or whether it's off the wall. Um, so occupational licensing is a perfect example of this. Occupational licensing protects an enormous number of incumbent interests. Um, it has all kinds of distorting effects. It has all kinds of distributive effects. Um, but the thing that protects it most durably is the fact that any other alternative to occupational licensing is viewed as simply nuts. Um, and the people who have a interest in it um, have a very strong uh, interest in making uh, in preserving that uh, that idea, right? Not even to defend the the substance of the argument for in, uh, for occupational licensing, but to so marginalize any other alternative that they don't even have to defend the merits of their policy. And you see that in a number of other areas. We have a critique of zoning. Zoning has often um, been viewed as uh, as something that only those on the very far libertarian fringe. Um, have any problem with. Um, and so when you think about information, it's got these two different levels. One is 
Um, information matters on uh, affecting whether or not uh, alternatives are on the agenda or not, and um, uh, embedded interests are able to put a lot of resources into keeping ideas off the agenda. Um, and it also affects it on the other side that those who might challenge it generally have less resources to invest in challenging um, those uh, what people on the left would call head hegemonic ideas. And then secondarily, information matters. Even if you get an idea on the agenda, it affects the uh, the scope of what policymakers think uh, they can actually do, what, and especially what they can do um, without taking on substantial risks to themselves. I just want to mention as an aside that when you talk to people in industry, which I, I have done in my life, not, not as often as I wish I had, but it's useful for, I think, for an economist to actually talk to people in the trenches, you know, they'll speak with disdain of their regulators that they don't know anything. And they don't sit around and you know, rub their hands together and twirl their ends of their mustache thinking, ha, 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 I can take advantage of this. What they do is they, they, they see the regulator is very uninformed about their business relative to themselves. Of course, they then have control over the, much of the information that the regulator receives. It's particularly true in, in finance, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. And as a result, there's a natural tendency. I don't, I don't think it's always sinister. I'm sure sometimes it's sinister. But a lot of times it's just um, they end up showing the regulators information that happens to be you know, conducive to less regulation or regulation that benefits incumbents or regulation that, that uh, helps them out in some way. And so th that's the process that I think you're pointing out that's very, very valuable to be aware of, which I think is easy to miss, which is the world's very complex. It's always going to be the case that the people in, in the trenches, the people actually building the products, the people who are actually creating the pharmaceuticals or uh, designing the uh, mortgage-backed securities will have a deeper understanding for all kinds of reasons about what's actually happening. But unfortunately, they're also blinded by their own self-interest. So they're not going to give the regulators the exact uh, information that they would need to make great decisions for a larger set of interests. So uh, either of you can react to that. It's just my uh, – yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, there's, this is Brink. Go there, ahead, Brink. Yeah, this is – yes. There's uh, there's no need to uh, ascribe sinister motives or mustache twirling to uh, to rent-seeking interests. I, I don't know if we've used that term rent-seeking so far, but that uh, crops up a lot in our book. And by rent-seeking, we simply mean uh, pursuing profits through the political process rather than uh, by adding value for customers, so getting rules written in a, in a favorable way. Uh, but uh, – but, uh, uh, by and large, uh, the interests that are uh, that are uh, trying to uh, you know get their way on uh, on Capitol Hill or uh, in Washington generally uh, see themselves as aligned with the public interest. Uh, uh, most people uh, don't. Uh, most people who are uh, you know like to think well of themselves, and uh, they're very good at rationalizing uh, how to think well of themselves. So uh, I'm I'm sure that the people who are on the other side of the issues we talk about uh, when they uh, when they are um, uh, it, it's really uh, an important part of being an effective rent seeker is is truly being sincere in your belief that uh, that what you're calling for is absolutely necessary for the public interest. So uh, we have disagreements about what that uh, entails, uh, but uh, but we don't need anybody to be actually scheming to uh, uh, to defraud anybody or to 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 be uh, engaged in misdeeds. So I want to say pers pursuit of self interest with partial information uh, can lead us to where we are. Yeah, I'd like to address just a point that uh, that Russ made. Um, one way to think about this is what are our assumptions about policymakers, uh, the people who are actually making decisions? One is, um, yes, there's, a, there's this asymmetrical information problem that Russ is describing, that the regulated know more than the regulator about their industry. Now, that, I think that's a variable rather than a constant, right? You can imagine different ways Good of point. organizing government in which there'd be less asymmetrical information. One of the things we emphasize is one of the problems of the revolving door is not just that the people People on the one side go over to the other side, but the people on the government side are often not around long enough to have heard all of the BS that the uh, that the regulated say, you know have argued and say, oh yeah, we you know you guys always say that right, uh, and then never turns out to be true. Well, if you're not there around long enough to have heard all those stories, then you're not going to be able to see through uh, through that. 
Um, so I think that's an important part of the story. The other thing is that policymakers, especially those in Congress, tend to be risk averse. Um, Doug Arnold, going back to his great book, The Logic of Congressional Action, argued that um, that policymakers, uh, A, you know, they're more likely to lose their seat than to fail to win it, right? They're more likely to lose a seat because uh, they do something that creates negative effects that then can be traced back to them. And therefore, they're highly worried that they're going to do something Something they're going to make an action, and, and then something bad is going to happen, and then people are going to say, "Oh, you caused that." Um, and that gives a lot of advantage to incumbent interests because, in many cases, all they're trying to do is defend the existing policy regime. And so, when somebody's saying, "Hey, we should have a big capital requirement on financial firms," um, all the finance people have to do is say, "Oh, this is going to have terrible, awful." consequences, right? Um, and they're going to be large and they're going to be unpredictable. And therefore, you should do something more modest or you should do a whole lot of small things. This is one of the arguments I have for what produces um, kleptocracy, which we talked about before. Um, and so, in again, in, when government itself doesn't have a lot of internal capacity or it doesn't have countervailing organizations on the other side that can produce information saying, actually, this measure you're talking about, getting rid of uh, licensing of dentists or putting a capital requirement on finance, um, isn't actually going to have all those terrible negative consequences. When that doesn't exist, that gives a very strong advantage to the existing incumbent interests. I just want to add a couple things, and then we'll segue into the four areas that you look at in, in the book for where you think that the that government action has worsened inequality and and hurt growth. The first is that um, the role of economists, and talked with um, uh, Luigi Zingales about this in an episode. I think it's an incredibly important point, which is that economists often reassure – Policymakers that they have no choice but to say bail out the creditors of a failed financial institution. That without it, there will be a disaster and it's it will be terrible. And of course, all those incentives you talked about, Steve, come into play. Uh, the regulator does not want a Great Depression on his watch, his being, say, Ben Bernanke's. Uh, so he's going to be very aggressive to make sure that things don't go uh, badly right now which means he can be setting the stage for something to go very badly in the future that he will not be necessarily blamed for. Economists like to encourage that kind of change because it, it makes them powerful. It, it makes them important. It it creates demand for, for economists to be steering economic stability, macroeconomic stability, financial stability. So I just think there's a terrible um, – implicit collusion there that's not – it's not explicit like we're talking about. something sinister about it, but just the self in, natural self-interest of the players pushes us in a particular direction. And similarly, uh, staying with finance for a minute, uh, I was arguing with someone on Twitter uh, the other day that about moral hazard. And this person who's in the investment business said, well, moral hazard's not important. No, Nobody, nobody – makes bad investments expecting to be bailed out. And I said, how do you know? He said, well, because you ask them and they say that, that it didn't affect them in the crisis. And I said, do you think maybe that they'd have an incentive to be honest or dishonest about that? Why, why would you take someone's word for it? This system of being bailed out is unbelievably beneficial to the financial sector. It's, uh, it's the gift that never stops giving and and you're and you're going to take on face value the claim that oh no that isn't why I kept making those bad investments it was just uh, uh, irrational exuberance so I, I think it's uh, it's a these kind of rationalizations that Brink talked about and I, I just think it's a very very important thing to be aware of when we think about what's really gone on in the world so let's move to finance uh, we've covered finance a lot on this program the kind of issues you raise so I want to talk about it briefly and move on to the other areas. But let's summarize uh, what you argue has uh, gone wrong with state intervention in the financial sector, particularly because most people on the left, I think the average American even, thinks that, well, the financial sector just – every once in a while, it just runs amok. It just goes berserk and, and there's nothing that can be done about it. It's just reality. It's just part of, part of life and that's the way it is. Uh, Brink, why don't you go first? Yeah, we uh – 
we do not claim to do any kind of comprehensive survey of financial regulation. Our goal simply is to identify a couple of major areas where we think uh, government policy is uh, through uh, regulatory capture uh, – uh, having bad effects on efficiency and growth and simultaneously uh, regressive uh, distributive effects. Uh, and um, uh, and here uh, in finance, uh, the, the, the case that this is sort of active government intervention in the economy uh, is harder to make uh, because there is uh, – other than in Scotland for a few decades in the late 1700s, there's just no laissez-faire back baseline in finance to judge interventions against. The modern state and modern finance co-evolved co-dependently. Uh, yep. They've been inextricably connected since the get-go. Uh, and so uh, it's very difficult to find any kind of pristine uh, laissez-faire uh, <clears throat> financial markets that then one would set as a baseline for against which you would look at intervention. So what we're looking at really is comparing different regulatory models and different regulatory systems and seeing what those different alternative uh, regulatory models, uh, uh, how they might work. Uh, the regulatory model that we've been uh, sustaining for a long time uh, is one that uh, where financial uh, firms are highly dependent on debt for their financing. Uh, in almost all other industries, debt loads uh, of higher than 50% of assets are uh, considered to be problematic and get your creditors worried and get your stock price nosing down. Uh, many companies have much lower debt loads than that. Apple famously didn't borrow at all uh, until quite recently. Um, but in the financial sector, um, uh, uh, leverage of you know, 95% of assets is uh, is commonplace. How does such a precarious and 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 uh, uh, vulnerable funding structure uh, persist, uh, in which only slight uh, decreases in asset values then make financial firms insolvent uh, because they're so highly leveraged? Uh, it uh, persists because of both an explicit. Uh, safety net uh, uh, for financial institutions in terms of the discount window and uh, lender of last resort function for the Fed and also deposit insurance for depositors. Uh, and then, as you alluded to, Russ, uh, this large implicit uh, guarantee to bail out uh, large or systemically important institutions uh, that we've seen again and again and again for decades, starting with the Continental Illinois bailout in the, the 80s, moving through uh, the, uh, the third world debt crisis of the 80s, moving then to the Mexican uh, debt crisis in the 90s and the Asian debt crisis, uh, the long-term capital management uh, bailout. There's been intervention after intervention where uh, banks got in over their heads and uh, government has stepped in uh, to ease their pain uh, and has introduced whopping amounts of moral hazard into the system. Uh, the, the moral hazard operates primarily, though, Russ, not on the, on the decision makers within the institutions. Uh, and uh, you know, they, they may think that they're uh, uh, managing risks correctly, and they may think uh, they may have skin in the game and, and, and not be trying to make a bet with uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, but the fact is, it's the, it's the effect of moral hazard on the creditors, keeping credit costs so low at such dizzying high levels of leverage uh, that's, that sustains this whole model. Uh, if we hadn't had this uh, this kind of persistent government propping up of high leverage, we wouldn't still have it. Uh, so it's persistent is an artifact of government policy, and it, it produces a financial system that is recurrently crisis prone. Steve? Yeah, the other dimension of this that I would want to emphasize um, uh, is that um, we often talk about the problem in finances, um, the recurrent crises and the bailouts. But government has also had a, uh, a role in propping up the financial industry in a much broader sense. Um, uh, one which uh, Brink didn't emphasize is the tax code. Uh, it gives a very strong bias uh, toward, uh, toward borrowing, and that's very important for highly leveraged firms like, uh, like in finance. Uh, the second is the way we've organized uh, retirement savings. We have huge, huge subsidies in the 401ks and IRAs. 
um, uh, that have encouraged a very large active management um, industry in, uh, in asset management. They have very large fees that, uh, for which there's no uh, economic justification. Um, those are not the very highest parts of the um, the financial industry. Those are not the tippy top of the one percent, but a lot of the bottom of the one percent are made up of uh, those asset managers whose jobs are purely a function of um, the way we've organized retirement savings. Um, and so there's actually a very broad set of subsidies and um, and regulations that have propped up the financial industry and have caused it to be much larger. Than it would be in other uh, other cases, and again, there's very substantial evidence um, from uh, uh, from economics that um, while a certain level of financialization is a good thing, you can definitely be under financialized. The United States is very far on the other end where financialization is actually associated with uh, declining innovation. Um, financialization also ends up sucking up a lot of uh, high end talent in human capital that causes a very big distortion of uh, what the most skilled and most uh, highly trained um, minds end up uh, doing. And that has a channel both into innovation and then uh, also into inequality. There's a puzzle there, though. And, and, of course, I'm very sympathetic to those general arguments across the board. And my essay uh, that we did an episode on gambling uh, with other people's money uh, will be coming out as a as a book soon, so uh, you know the excitement's palpable out there in listener land. I hope, hope that <laughs> some people I hope some people will look at it. We'll see. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to that. The question is, you know, it's it's easy to make these kind of claims. I make them all the time, but I think you have to ask also. And for me, I, I, a better way to say this is uh, one of the costs of this is distorting the allocation of capital. Uh, you know, we put trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars into houses that, that just it would have been better to put it into cancer research or uh, making a, a better electric car or a thousand things that that would have probably made life better than having bigger houses and more of them, uh, which just doesn't seem that was a distorted choice. But then the issue is that's one thing. But the issue is you're making a broader claim than that. And, and I make this claim as well, again, so I'm criticizing myself, which is that and, – and the opportunity to borrow money has made these institutions dramatically larger, has attracted, as you say, talented people into them. So it does raise the question, though, why the salaries are so high. I understand why the returns are high for the, the investors who, who've profited from this and the people at the very top who run these institutions um, – when they spent their own money, when they were partnerships, they were smaller and they made less money. Now they're larger and they're compensated more generously because it's hard to run a large organization and have that responsibility. But it, it's not just the handful of people at the top. It's people all the way down through the food chain of these organizations. And it's curious why their salaries are, are so large uh, given the claim that, that we're making that it's not that they're so skilled at what they're doing and they're doing all this great investing. It's more that they've just been subsidized to to be able to spend other people's money, which is lovely when you – nice work if you can get it. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so just as far as the, the salary disparity, it, it's, it's quite arresting. Uh, back uh, 30 years ago, uh, financial professionals generally made – comparable pay to comparably skilled uh, professionals in other sectors. Uh, but now uh, they earn uh, on average a, f- a 50% premium uh, for top financial executives. They earn a 250% premium uh, over uh, comparable executives in other industries. So there really is a, a, a you know, this is a, a, a an incredibly lucrative uh, line of work. Uh, and uh, why uh, the industry hasn't grown enough uh, to reduce uh, those salary disparities is uh, maybe there's just limits on on, on how much uh, financialization could then arbitrage away the salary differences. So you're stuck with those big ones. Um, but uh, in, in general, uh, we uh, the the game is that uh, when times are good, uh, uh, but the game is running excessive risks, uh, which gives you in good times very high returns. Those high returns uh, then uh, get channeled into uh, into the pay of uh, all those uh, people we're talking about. Uh, when times are bad, though, uh, excessive risks turn into unnecessary losses. Those losses, however, are socialized. 
So uh, basically, uh, the uh, the financial sector is running one way bets with with pay. Uh, they get uh, they privatize the gains and they socialize the losses and and financial. Nobody else gets to do that. Uh, so uh, so finance gets paid better uh, because of these one way bets. It doesn't explain though why uh, a bright. We're talking about this flow of human capital, which I think again is another of the really actually the more disturbing or or destructive part of this. Uh, and I mentioned the allocation misallocation of capital. It's the misallocation of human capital that I think, uh, Steve, you referred to earlier, where some of the for a long time now in America, some of the brightest uh, young men and women coming out of MBA programs and out of even science programs have gone into uh, financial the financial sector because the pay is so generous. Which you could argue, uh, you know, that would be a, that would be. Uh, okay if they were actually making the world a better place. And as we've all admitted, they sometimes do. The existence of the financial sector is crucial. Uh, but the size of it and the way it's structured is not crucial. This is to, what, to our – maybe negative in its impact on our economy. So the question is why they have to attract the best and the brightest to do things in the trenches that are really not that difficult, not that transformative. They're not inventing the next uh, – autonomous vehicle or whatever it is why is it that those that those pay levels attract those or are set at those levels I, I, you'd think they wouldn't have to so there's something else going on there i think that those don't get competed away well let's i mean let me think about this um in one way right so one of the questions is going back to brink's point about why are um are is pay in this sector so much higher than it used to be um one way to think about this is institutionally um, that the way we've organized finance is just a lot different than it used to be. One way to think about this is in the mortgage business, which is a huge high volume business. It, it, it looms very large in the whole um, area that we're talking about. If you go back 30 or so years, um, the basic way that we organized mortgage finance was through savings and loans. Um, we had thousands upon thousands of them. Um, it, some of them were extremely small. My, the little town my mom grew up in South Carolina uh, had its own Lake City savings and loan um, that made uh, that made mortgage loans mainly just in the town and the outlying areas. And that regulatory regime, which was also obviously connected to Glass-Steagall, had the distributive effect of producing a lot of middle and upper middle class bankers who could afford to pay their country club fees. Um, when that blew up, but they didn't. Um, but they couldn't. Replaced- have, they couldn't afford to buy their own islands. <laughs> that was the- afford, right, right. So, that, well, look, right, let me let me get to the people who can afford to pay, uh, pay uh, to buy their own islands. So, when the savings and loan regime blew up. Um, We essentially substituted the mortgage securitization regime, um, where now, right, we're still making lots of mortgages, but we've got mortgage originators, and then we have uh, people who are trading mortgage securities. That's a much smaller group of people than in the previous regime, um, but much more concentrated. They're more um, economically concentrated. There's a smaller number of them. They're much more uh, geographically concentrated. They're not in uh, Lake City, South Carolina, right there in uh, New York and just a few other places. And so you have a much more concentrated set of gains from one regime rather than the other. The other side of this is when you think about the asset management side, um, 40 years ago, a lot of that asset management was in um, employer pension funds. That's a case where the um, the employer of various sorts had a lot more leverage over the asset managers um, in uh, setting what their returns were going to be because they were large institutions that had that kind of bargaining power. As we move to 401ks and IRAs, and now you have all this uh, proliferation of active uh, management and asset management, the, if you look at the, um, the amount that they uh, charge in terms of fees is a lot larger than the amount that was being charged to, um, uh, to employers through pension funds. So both of those explain why you have a concentration and an increase in uh, returns, and that affects the, uh, the resources that firms can distribute internally to their own employees. So let's move on because uh, I want to touch at least touch on and say a little bit more about the other areas you talk about. So finance is a big discussion in the book. You then turn to intellectual property and the patent system, copyright, et cetera. And most people would argue in the abstract, well, that's good for growth and innovation. That uh, 
and 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 that innovation is good for lots of people, not just the innovators, but because those new products often benefit large swaths of the population. So the standard argument: we need patents and copyright to protect intellectual property because without that, we'll have less incentive for innovation. People's work will be stolen, copied, the returns will be lower, and we won't get as much as we otherwise would have. What's your argument on intellectual property? Yeah, it's definitely counterintuitive to classify uh, intellectual property as an as an anti-growth measure, since its whole justification is to provide is to sweeten incentives for innovation um, by giving innovators temporary monopolies and thereby raising their returns. The idea is to increase their incentives to innovate, um, and that works, right? There are benefits to intellectual property protection. Certain innovators are incentivized. Uh, however, uh, also costs are imposed by these temporary monopolies. We typically think of the trade-off between producers on the one hand and consumers on the other. That is, the, the consumers are having to pay a little extra uh, because of these uh, patent and copyright monopolies, but in the long run, they benefit because they get more innovative products down the line that they are able to purchase that wouldn't even be available uh, if it weren't uh, for the subsidy that they're providing uh, to innovators through uh, patents and copyrights. Um, but uh, there's also uh, costs imposed on other producers, downstream innovators. Uh, so um, when you are trying to come up with some new invention and you need to uh, use pre-existing ideas and recombine them in some novel way uh, to make your, uh, your new uh, widget, um, Patents and copyrights can uh, can block your access to those upstream ideas, make it more difficult uh, to access them, and therefore uh, discourage downstream innovation. Uh, <clears throat> what we've seen in the past 30 or 40 years is, is an explosion in the scope of intellectual property law, explosion in the scope of, of copyrightable material, explosion, explosion in the scope of uh, patentable inventions. Uh, the number of patents issued every year is five times uh, now what it was back uh, in the early 1980s. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, uh, the, the costs for downstream innovators have multiplied dramatically without any corresponding extra incentive benefits uh, being delivered by the patents and copyrights. So we see this as an area that's always had costs and benefits, uh, but because of an explosion in the law in recent in these laws in recent decades, the the costs have grown completely out of proportion uh, to the benefits. So that now, uh, especially in patent law. Uh, uh, the, the main uh, function of the law is just to create a legal minefield uh, for innovators who can be shaken down by so-called patent trolls uh, who buy up portfolios of patents just to we weaponize them and litigate them on, uh, litigate on them. So what, uh, what should have been uh, pro-innovation policy is perversely turned into pro-lawyer policy. Steve, you want to add? Yeah, I mean, the other uh, effect on this, uh, first of all, is it uh, plays into concentration. Um, yeah. That is, the more you have uncertainty as to whether or not your uh, your innovation or the way you're using an innovation is um, going to be litigated, um, large firms have the ability to handle that in a way that small firms don't. Uh, small firms can be very worried that they're um, their innovation or the product they have is simply going to be destroyed by a patent troll, and that encourages them to simply sell out to uh, larger firms um, uh, or to never be created in the first place. Um, the other thing about this is it also plays into the inequality story that we're telling. Um, uh, a lot of, especially in the entertainment side, which is where on the copyright side, um, the uh, the beneficiaries are not usually little plucky um, uh, musicians, right? They're very large consolidated media companies like Disney um, or the large recording uh, firms who uh, want to protect um, the benefits that they uh, have from a few superstars and to apply that globally. And so by extending copyright uh, terms, um, that mainly ends up uh, increasing the amount of uh, profit they can get from that very small number of superstar um, uh, recorders with it or uh, entertainers without actually affecting the amount of people who are going in on the front end, which is the thing that really produces innovation and that produces new forms of, uh, of creative uh, productivity. And we did an episode uh, with Robin Feldman on this topic that I encourage listeners who missed it to go back and listen to, which is uh, was quite 
quite surprising again as an example of how if you look a little more deeply into how the businesses actually work with the regulation, you get a really a much richer picture of what's going on. And she catalogs quite impressively to me how pharmaceutical companies have, have been able to use patents to extend uh, that monopoly power uh, for a longer time than they otherwise would through very creative and interesting in interesting ways that are not so good for cost for either patients or taxpayers who often are paying for the for the medicine. Um, now, there's two other areas you look at. One is occupational licensing. We have an, at licensing. We have an episode coming up on that, uh, so I want to move quickly through that. But I just want to mention one important thing about licensing that you highlight that I think is crucial and often forgotten, which is well, you don't want just anybody doing heart surgery on you. You need you need to have it be licensed. So you need to make sure the person's skilled and all, et cetera. But I think the most important part of licensing is in in the big areas that we often talk about, such as doctors, dentists, uh, and lawyers, is the tasks that you require a licensed person to perform that could be performed by someone else. So you want to talk about that briefly? Sure. Uh, yeah, you're 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 absolutely right uh, that uh, that licensing really isn't doesn't do its work by ensuring that incredibly complicated tasks are performed by highly trained people. So you use the example, of course, we don't want somebody just walking off the street doing heart surgery. Uh, but the fact is that there is no licensing of heart surgeons. There is only licensing <laughs> of general practitioners. If you complete a U.S. residency in anything and 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 pass a state medical uh, exam, you are a doctor licensed to practice medicine. Uh, so if you complete a residency in podiatry and pass a state uh, licensing exam, you are legally entitled to do heart transplants or brain surgery or anything you can convince anybody to let you do. But of course, that's not going to happen because no practice will hire you. No hospital will give you admitting or surgical privileges. Simple commercial incentives backstopped by concerns about malpractice liability will suffice to ensure that highly complicated tasks are performed by highly trained people. What licensing does is ensure the tasks that don't require uh, all that extensive training are still performed by highly trained people, uh, and they have a captive audience, and they can overcharge for it. Uh, so uh, there's there's just no problem uh, with with you know uh, <clears throat> wildcat brain surgery, uh, but there's a lot of problem uh, with. Uh, with people having to pay too much uh, to get a finger splinted or to check out for an ear infection or to do lots of other humdrum uh, things that mid-level professional, professionals like nurse practitioners could perform fine, uh, but that in uh, many, most states are, are not allowed to do so uh, because of the licensing regime. Steve? Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, impacts that uh, that this has, especially on innovation, is the way that it affects business model innovation. That's one of the areas where um, where growth uh, comes from. Right, it comes from people finding new ways to organize uh, the way the industry is uh, structured. So, uh, in some places, there's been a uh, a move toward uh, more minute clinics or other kinds of things that are doing not the full spectrum of medical practice, but are doing a lot of the uh, the relatively smaller things that in many cases clog up uh, hospital um, uh, emergency rooms. Uh, you could imagine an enormous amount of innovation by having different kinds of people performing uh, some of those functions. But in many states, um, you have to have a doctor uh, present, even if the doctor isn't really doing anything other than kind of waving his hand um, over and making an incantation and saying that a doctor was in, uh, was involved. Um, and so that clearly uh, slows down that innovation and in how the basic um, medical industry is organized. Um, and the other thing is it means there's less opportunity for real creative destruction of rent of the way that we talked about before. One of the things that drives, um, uh, again, the counteracting effects that markets can sometimes have on inequality is where there's super normal profits. There's an incentive for market entry for people to come in and hoover up some of those profits and take them away from incumbents. And the biggest, one of the biggest effects that uh, occupational licensing does is it protects um, the incumbents from those kind of large-scale challenges to um, uh, to their incomes. And I think that's one of the reasons why 
um, especially in the United States, without especially without a very strong state counter uh, acting force on medical uh, incomes. We also haven't had a market uh, counteracting effect on medical income. So we both has again this double whammy of um, slowing down innovation, driving up um, the prices that we pay, and um, uh, protecting the uh, the swollen incomes of market incumbents. Yeah, just to take an example. Uh it's it's a good thing that um, dental hygienists are allowed to clean my teeth rather than the dentist herself because the skill required to do it it's not trivial but it's not doesn't require a dental degree and yet I'm pretty sure you can't open your own teeth cleaning office as a dental hygienist I assume you have to do it within a dental office because as you say at the end of it. My dentist comes in and makes sure my teeth haven't fallen out in the meanwhile since I last saw him. And he says, uh, everything's fine. See ya. Uh, now, I'm exaggerating. And, of course, there are times when I'm really glad there's a dentist there. And I'm a big fan of my dentist, by the way, which it's taken me a while to find one I'm, I'm a fan of. So I'm happy about that. Uh, but it's uh, – and I think he actually listens to Econ Talks. So if you're listening, doctor, uh, I hope you appreciate that compliment. I know you'd prefer a marketing plug too, but I'm not going to do that. Sorry. Uh, but I think it's probably illegal for a dental hygienist to open a shop saying, I clean teeth. Do you guys know? Yeah, that's, um, that's uh, certainly true in almost every state, and it has a couple of effects. One is you can think about um, the, the rent extraction. Sorry to use the pun yeah, here. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, yeah, I know. Um, I like uh, you get to the is, root of the problem. Uh, yeah. yeah, It's not just from consumers. That's the one that's easy to imagine, but it's also this lateral extraction of rent from the dental hygienist, right? The dental hygienist could be getting higher incomes if they were able to sell their services directly to the public. It wouldn't be hard to imagine uh, freestanding teeth cleaning um, uh, services and malls that were basically just being done by dental hygienists. But because they have to operate inside dentist office offices, um, their income is lower and the, and the income of the doctors is higher. Um, and I think that's a very substantial um, effect. The other thing that's interesting is before we've really talked about the way that some of these um, uh, some of these rent seeking uh, operations end up encouraging concentration. In many cases, especially in the occupational licensing, they have the opposite. They encourage um, uh, unnatural uh, levels yeah. of um, of market fracturing. In fact, that's exactly what the professionals want. They don't want to turn into employees of large firms that could drive down their incomes. They want to be freestanding um, providers, and the regulatory regime uh, preserves that. And you see that all across lots of other areas. You see that in car dealers. Car dealers uh, try and get franchising laws that keep them from being consolidated into the Car companies, um, doctors, dentists, optometrists, right? We have most states have laws that prevent optometrists from being directly employed by um, optician firms like lens crafters. Um, that's why when you know whenever you do see an opto a opt uh, optometrist who's in a uh, lens crafters or somewhere, they're in this weird separate office that's theirs. Um, that's a function of the regulatory regime. Um, if they were consolidated into these large firms, they would be turned into employees, and there would be that kind of pressure on their uh, their income. So the and um, so it, it affects innovation, um, and it also again has this very strong impact of reducing business model uh, change. So the last area you look at is zoning, which we've talked about a lot on this program in, in a couple of different episodes and in passing in many other episodes. So I want to move past that. It's, it's important for you know two reasons. It makes homeowners, landowners in large cities very wealthy, and it makes it hard for poor, poor people to move toward higher paying alternatives. So it, it works to increase inequality uh, in two ways. But I, I want to, I'm going to move past that. And I also want to move past the fact that you didn't cover education, which I think is another area where governments made uh, the poor poor uh, by failing to educate them well. But uh, we don't have a lot of time left, and I want to hear your thoughts on what's to be done. Uh, so I look at this problem and these problems, and I say, you know, the incentives here for the policymakers and for the people in these industries are pretty powerful. Uh, unless you change those, I don't think much is going to change. Uh, so my, you know, my strategy is to educate people about their existence and hope that 
somehow percolates through the political process as well as just being people aware of what's happening. That's a good thing. But you have a different agenda. So uh, why don't you talk about what we can do to reduce these um, state well, no, I mean, I, I, I think education and, and sort of consciousness raising is very much part of the solution uh, because what is uh, what is needed uh, to offset uh, the distorting power of the rich and powerful uh, uh, distorting the political process is countervailing power by other uh, public spirited uh, rich and powerful people. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, in uh, we in the book, we. Uh, uh, we go through examples where uh, sustained philanthropic pushes uh, to create uh, countervailing political power have been successful and have completely changed the political landscape for big issue areas. First, in the environmental movement back in the 60s and 70s, uh, enormous philanthropic support for creating all these environmental institutions uh, that uh, and organizations uh, that uh, then were able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with uh, polluting industries. And more recently, in the the school reform movement, uh, where once everything was completely dominated by teachers' unions at the school board level, uh, now we've had this big philanthropic push for charter schools and uh, and uh, and other kinds of reforms, uh, where the political landscape is has shifted and reformers now have uh, have much more oomph than they used to have. Something similar could happen in the rent-seeking area uh, if uh, if if the effort were made. So our first call is for uh, is for uh, this kind of sustained philanthropic support for an anti-rent-seeking public interest uh, uh, agenda. You need to have 90% uh, uh, of uh, success in life is just showing up. Uh, the rent seekers show up all the time at all the obscure venues where policy is made. Uh, the good guys, the people who are representing the taxpayer and the consumer uh, almost never show up. Uh, so they <clears throat> that uh, that participation needs to be subsidized, and if it is, uh, that can go a long way towards uh, towards offsetting the uh, the advantages of the rent seekers. Uh, you don't need equality of uh, political participation, but you need some sort of uh, effort on the other side uh, to avoid getting rolled. Steve. Yeah, and the other thing I think that um, that what Russ was talking about, and we talked earlier about this idea of the second face of power, um, the ability to keep things off the agenda. You're already seeing how a shift in that, uh, which often comes through ideas, can have a very uh, powerful and often quite sudden effect on policymaking. So again, we've only a few years into this discussion of the way that constraints on housing um, are affecting uh, the prices in uh, high growth areas and the effects of that in economic growth. But we're already starting to see a change in policy. California uh, just recently um, passed a uh, highly compromised, problematic, um, but again, a first step on um, on putting some leverage of the state uh, against localities that are um, that are preventing housing from being built. Um, I just saw it yesterday. Salt Lake City um, is uh, um, putting a lot of, uh, of, uh, of energy behind um, encouraging uh, the building of um, accessory dwelling units, which is a great way to increase housing. A lot of that is because the default position um, that that's created by the environment of ideas, whether people think that there's a problem that um, the ability to build in this case um, is related to. Um, has an effect on the degree to which um, existing uh, power holders are able to get their way. I think we're going to be seeing that increasingly in occupational licensing. It's harder for policymakers simply to license a new occupation without um, uh, having to deal with the fact that there is at least this critique sort of in the air in a kind of very vague way, in a way that things like podcasts like this end up uh, influencing. And so I think both of those sides are important. One is that side of um, big general ideas that affect whether or not uh, um, new ideas can get onto the agenda. And the second is that subsidized information that ensures that when they are on the agenda, that somebody is armed with uh, alternatives that actually make sense and aren't compromised. Um, those two things, uh, which are uh, which demand both um, external resources from uh, organizations that are mobilized around these areas, and the internal capacity of government to process information, can help um, at least at the margin influence the degree to which uh, existing incumbent power holders are able to get their way. My guests today have been Brink Lindsay and Stephen Tellis. Their book is 
the captured economy, how the powerful enrich themselves, slow down growth, and increase inequality. Gentlemen, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.